You know, I've been around for a while. Met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you just might think that there's not much that can take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories. Science and things that amaze and confound me. Every single day, incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night, some I can answer. Others just defy logic. Does the human body contain inexplicable mysteries beyond the reach of medical science? In Arkansas, a skydiver plummets to the earth from over 11,000 feet. And somehow survives. How? In New York, a man is vaporized as he lies in bed. Can humans spontaneously combust? I've been to fires before, too, and it never, anything, nothing like that. And in England, a young girl becomes supercharged with electricity. Is she a walking power grid? She wouldn't touch me if she was switching the light switch on because a jolt of electricity would go through her. Yeah. It's a weird world, and I love it. The human body. Remarkable, isn't it? Well, this one is anyway. Just a candid shot of me at the beach. But this is what we all look like underneath. Unless you believe in reincarnation, we only get one of these. But do we really appreciate just how incredible these things that carry us around are, or do we take them for granted? You see, many believe we're much more than just skin and bones. That there's things going on inside us that modern medicine may never be able to explain. Is it true? Do you think they can help me with my indigestion? October 9th, 2005. Siloam Springs, Arkansas. Hi, what's your name? Do you know my name? Adrenaline junkie Shayna Richardson, 21, is about to attempt her first solo skydive. <laughs> All right, Shayna. Shana's husband, Rick West, was also her jump instructor. I was very confident that, you know, that she was well prepared for this. Rick has a helmet camera Hi, Shana. <laughs> to capture Shana's jump. Together, they will free fall from an altitude of 11,000 feet, more than two miles high. At first, things go great. We exited the plane well and she did a perfect dive. Rick and Shayna are plummeting to Earth at terminal velocity, 120 miles per hour. After 30 seconds of freefall, Shayna pulls the ripcord. And as you see in the video, I say, Woo! Good job, Shayna. And I had no idea at this time that she was in any kind of trouble until I look up. What Rick sees fills him with horror. On her very first jump, his wife's main parachute has failed. Desperate, Shayna releases it and tries her reserve. And then her reserve didn't work out so well. Unable to help, Rick realizes he is watching what will be his wife's final moments. Shayna is spinning out of control. Shayna! 8,000 feet from the ground, Shayna's reserve parachute is tangled. She is now plummeting uncontrollably towards the ground at over 70 feet per second. Panic sets in. Shayna! 
sheet kept spinning and kept spinning and spinning. And the closer and closer we get, I'm seeing cars, semis, the road, buildings. She was heading right into. Helpless, Rick can only watch as Shana spins towards certain death. It was horrible for me. It was just a sickening feeling. To Rick's horror, Shayna slams directly into a parking lot. I was sure she was dead or going to be dead really quick. And as soon as I landed, I turned the camera off, and I was just trying to get to her in time to tell her that I love her, and I'm sorry. She was actually laying in a pool of blood. Her bottom lip had been busted, peeled out, uh, split above her nose, was wide open. You could almost see the bone. But something miraculous has happened. I really did firmly believe that I was going to die. Despite smashing into asphalt from a height of two miles, Shayna is somehow alive. My face hit a split second before the rest of my body did. The doctors described my facial fractures as kind of an eggshell effect. I broke pretty much every bone in my face, my ocular sockets, my sinus cavity. I knocked out the front five teeth in my mouth, so they had to completely rebuild my face. I broke my pelvis in three places. I broke my right leg. Shayna's doctors can't comprehend how she survived her fall, but then their jaws drop even lower. Shayna's not the only survivor. The very first thing I remember hearing from the doctors was about the baby. Unknown to both Shayna and Rick, she's pregnant. Miraculously, both mother and baby survive. Their son, Tanner, is now five. Somehow, this remarkable story has a happy ending, but the doctors are still trying to figure it out. The doctors in that hospital just said, this is, a, this is amazing, this is a miracle. I don't understand. So how are Shayna and her unborn child able to survive such an unbelievable fall? What had happened that saved their lives? Dr. Chris Hart is an expert in aviation accident investigation. He's extensively studied Shayna's accident and has reached a controversial conclusion. I think the way she hit the ground is, is critically important for why she survived. It's believed that Shayna face planted into the ground. But Hart disagrees. Looking at the video, I don't believe she hit the ground face first. Clearly, she's at about a 45 to 60 degree angle. So when she finally makes contact with the ground, she contacts feet first, then legs, then side, and then finally head. The, the injuries to her pelvis and to her legs are, are very common when someone lands feet first. If it's a head first injury, you typically don't see those types of injuries. Hart believes that the angle of Shayna's fall was critical to her survival, as it enabled her to inadvertently perform a skydiving safety technique. I think just the laws of physics dictated that the way her body hit was very similar to a parachute landing fall. The parachute landing fall is a technique for improving the odds of surviving a hard landing without injury. The technique is essentially to distribute the force of impact over five body points. You start with contacting on the balls of the feet, and then the calves, then the thighs, then the hips, and then the side of the back. You can think of the parachute landing falls almost being like a bumper on a car. The head is what you want to protect. The body acts as the shock absorber. But what about the damage to Shayna's face? How could a successful parachute landing fall have resulted in such horrific injuries? Even though she didn't hit face first, her body was traveling at a very high rate of speed. She sustained injuries to every part of her body that hit the ground. Her face was probably the last thing that hit the ground, but it was still moving fast enough to cause some pretty serious injuries. Given her lack of training, it's very fortunate that Shayna executed what was very similar to a parachute landing fall. Had she not done that, she almost certainly would have perished. She should consider herself very fortunate. Did the accidental execution of the parachute landing fall save Shayna's life? Or is the explanation beyond the understanding of science? She was exempt from the laws of gravity. 
21-year-old Shayna Richardson experiences every skydiver's nightmare. When her parachutes fail, she slams into the ground from 11,000 feet. But amazingly, Shayna survives. How? Sophie Burnham is an author. She believes Shayna's survival was, quite literally, a miracle. To me, her survival is incomprehensible, except by divine intervention. It had to be the hand of an angel. She was exempt from the laws of gravity. We've all heard of angels, but let's just make sure we're on the same page as Sophie. The angels are messengers of the divine, and they can come in any form. They come to the innocent, to people whose work is not yet finished on this plane of existence. Angels save people from possible death in any way that it can be done. Sometimes it's by deflecting a bullet, and sometimes it's by preventing a car accident. They can change all the physical laws of the universe. No doubt they do good work, but how exactly did an angel save Shana? It is not difficult for me to believe that an angel carried Shana down or broke her fall so that she would not fall as swiftly as she should have. It's an interesting theory, but is it supported by scientific proof? Lots of times, miracles occur with scientific explanations and are just as miraculous I don't think that science and miracles are mutually exclusive. And I think that there is a spiritual dimension that we live in as fish live in water. I am sure that some people completely dismiss the idea that an angel could save Shana's life. And I think it's very important for some people to believe that they are in control. We don't want to be so completely at the mercy of fate and fortune that there's nothing that we can do. I would not try to dissuade somebody from that position if it's important to him. But to me, I would need very, very strong proof of something that happened. <laughs> like she pulled a third para parachute out and came down. I would need very strong scientific proof. I can't imagine what would have happened if an angel had not saved Shana that day. There would have been her body splattered over the parking lot in a gory, bloody, disgusting, horrible, horrible accident. It would have been ghastly. Wow, this is incredible. Instead of being splattered all over the parking lot, Sophie thinks an angel swooped down at the last moment, somehow taking hold of Shayna, breaking her fall. Could this really be possible? Regardless of your beliefs, one has to admit that Shayna's story is, well, miraculous. But could a guardian angel have slowed Shana's fall, sparing her life the life of her unborn son? And if so, don't they deserve some thanks? There is no evidence that guardian angels exist. There is no empirical evidence for it. OK, it's just, it's just people trying to put meaning onto things they don't understand. You know, this is the 21st century, for goodness sake. We need to move on. John Leach is a survival psychologist with the Norwegian Armed Forces. He believes the key to Shana's survival lies in a theory that's far more down to earth. If a person is falling without a parachute, after about 12 seconds, they'll reach the maximum rate of descent. And it doesn't matter how long they're falling for, they will stay at 120 miles an hour. If Shana had hit the ground at normal terminal velocity of 120 miles an hour, she would have had a very small chance of surviving that, especially on the, on the sort of ground that she hit. Now, there are cases of people who have survived from terminal velocity, but usually uh, it's because they've gone into soft ground, they've gone into mud, they've gone into snow, they've gone into trees. So there's something that's actually decelerated their, their speed at the last minute. 
But if her chances of surviving were so low, how is it that Shayna and Tanner are still with us? You can see from the, uh, the video that although the parachute was uh, malfunctioning, it wasn't completely dysfunctional. In other words, it was still acting as a sort of parachute and providing a degree of drag. So instead of hitting the ground at 120 miles an hour, which is a terminal velocity for somebody traveling without a parachute, uh, she hit the ground at 50 miles an hour, according to the records. Was Shayna's survival connected to how fast she hit the ground? Or did something else save her? Age plays a role in survival for various reasons. And a number of studies involving uh, analysis of, for example, road traffic accidents at different speeds shows that one of the best ages for surviving an impact at 50 miles an hour is Shana's age. So somewhere between the uh, late teens and early 20s. For Leach, the final factor in Shana's survival is the angle of impact though with a very different take to Dr. Chris Hart. I don't think she'd be uh, deploying any parachute landing technique. The parachute was moving her into a more horizontal position, and the injuries that she sustained is consistent with that type of impact on the ground. And the fact that she hit the ground more or less horizontally rather than on her head or through her feet uh, also increased the chances of survival. For Leach, the combination of a partially effective parachute Shana's age, and landing almost flat to the ground is enough to leave her battered, but still breathing. All these factors together all contribute to her chances of surviving. So there's nothing miraculous about it. It's straightforward physics. I did jump one more time. When Tanner was six weeks old, I went and jumped again. I did a tandem jump. I landed, took my gear off, grabbed my son, and I haven't been back up. I, I love the sport. I love the thrill of it. but. My kids give me a much greater thrill, and I, I don't have it in me anymore. I can't do it. Can Shana's remarkable survival be explained by physics? Or did divine intervention play a part? Was she saved by a higher power? Or did she just get lucky and deploy the parachute landing fall? For now, it will remain a head-scratcher that's most definitely weird. Oh, what? In upstate New York, a man is incinerated in his own bed. With no plausible explanation, investigators are left with a terrifying question. Can we spontaneously combust? When someone is cremated, there's probably more remains after that cremation than there was at this incident. You know, a fire is a wonderful thing. We've harnessed its power in so many ways we'd be lost without it. It does everything keeping us warm to one of my favorites, cooking up a storm. <laughs> well, that's, uh, if you can get started, of course. The thing about fire is that, uh, as well as being our friend, it can be our worst enemy. Does anyone smell anything that, uh, In 1986, college student Ray Harlan was visiting his father, Jack, a coroner in New York State, when the phone rang. It would lead them on the most mysterious and bizarre journey of their lives. My dad owns a local funeral home, and he was also the county coroner. They just said that there was an unattended death, and one of us always went with them to help them with removals. The deceased is a 58-year-old retired fireman, George Mott. When Ray and Jack arrive at Mott's house, everything seems normal. It was just a typical home in the back roads of the Adirondacks. But nothing has prepared the Harlands for what they find inside. The first words out of the state trooper's mouth to my dad was, uh, I don't think you're going to need your stretcher for this one. Entering the house, Ray and Jack notice something that tells them this is no ordinary death. There was a thin black film covering everything. It was like a dust powder. 
It was strange because it looked like there was a fire, but there was nothing really charred. Where is George Mott? As they move deeper into the house, they're about to make a shocking discovery. When we walked into the bedroom, you could see where Mr. Mott was laying. In my lifetime growing up in the funeral home, I've probably seen over a thousand bodies in various conditions. And I've been to fires before too, and there's never been anything, nothing like that. It was a perfect outline of his body burned into the mattress. And the only thing that was left of him was his head, a few ribs, and his right foot. Everything else was gone. What happened to George Mott? The charred remains suggest he died in a fire, but this was no ordinary blaze. Using the fire instead, the whole body remains. You never see parts of the body missing. To put it in perspective, when someone is cremated for five to six, sometimes seven hours, there's, there's probably more remains after that cremation than there was at this incident. It's a baffling and gruesome mystery. George Mott has been incinerated to a fine powder, but somehow the objects around him are not even singed, including a canister of matches only inches away. But how? Remarkably, all over Mott's house, there is evidence that this was a fire unlike any other. Everything plastic was melted. The casing on the TV was distorted, and the telephone was melted to a ball plastic. It's an incredible puzzle. What sort of heat or fire could vaporize a man and melt plastic but not burn the house down? The fireman thought it was a gas leak underneath his bed, but if it was a gas leak and it was fire, there would have been a lot more burning. They'd never found a gas leak. It's left to Ray to offer a theory. I mentioned human spontaneous combustion and everybody looked at me like I was crazy. Spontaneous human combustion, or SHC, is a bizarre and weird phenomenon in which a person instantly bursts into flames for no apparent reason. Amazingly, there have been 40 other cases of SHC documented in the last century. To that point, I don't think anybody in that room has heard of it. And everybody almost had the same reaction. What a spontaneous combustion, what is that? The investigation into George Mott's death failed to reach a conclusion, but Ray Harlan has no doubt what happened. I still believe that it was spontaneous combustion because there's was, there was no other explanation. This is what I saw. Now, this is weird or what? I mean, we know heavy metal rock drummers spontaneously combust all the time, but an innocent, harmless man minding his own business in bed and then Puff, he goes up in smoke. I mean, what's going on here? Are any of us safe? Oh no, not again! Was George Mott a victim of SHC? Can a human simply ignite and burn without any external cause? Spontaneous human combustion is amazing, bizarre, horrific, given all that. It still happens. A man is incinerated by a bizarre, inexplicable fire. Is his death proof that people can just spontaneously catch fire? We have spent more than three decades looking at this incredibly weird phenomenon, and our conclusion is absolutely categorically, yes, it does happen. Larry Arnold is a writer. He's dedicated himself to the study of SHC. He came to the scene of the George Mott conflagration. To be at the scene of one of these remarkably rare and phenomenal events is eerie. It's unearthly. We look at the person who used to be there, and we're looking at something burned more completely than after several hours at several thousand degrees Fahrenheit. The George Mott fire scene is incredibly complex and very puzzling, even to someone such as ourselves who has looked at scores of cases that seem to emulate the kind of fire that consumed Mr. Mott. Something burned up Mr. Mott more completely than can be accomplished in a crematorium. His body burned through his bed, actually pushed the mattress springs into a V, burned through the boarding underneath the mattress, burned through the floorboards, 
and into a crawl space below. There is no heat or flame damage directly above the point of combustion that consumed Mr. Mott. We could touch the ceiling. It was about seven and a half feet high. Not a scorch mark of any kind on the ceiling directly above the point of combustion. In most fires, heat rises. We would expect to see a lot of heat and flame damage above the bed. Zero. Throughout the house, there was a nonsensical pattern of melted plastics or not melted plastics. Um, it, it's baffling to us to this day, and we spent a lot of hours, as did the county officials, investigating this fire scene. But if Mott self-immolated, how did it happen? Arnold believes the answer can be found in something so tiny, we can't even see it. We wondered how much energy it takes to cremate someone like George Mott in the natural conditions, and if there could be a particle that would have that amount of energy contained within it. So we pulled up a theory from quantum physics, crunched the numbers, you come up with a particle that is incredibly small, much smaller than an atom, but it has an energy level of which is humongous. Arnold calls these subatomic particles pyrotrons. He believes they may be tiny, but they pack a punch. It's so small that it can pass through three-dimensional matter almost unimpeded, perhaps through galaxies without ever striking something. But according to Arnold, when the pyrotron does connect with something physical, the results are catastrophic. But on rare occasion, luck runs out, happenstance happens, and in those conditions when the pyrotron, with it, its incredibly high energy impacts something that's inside a human being, we posit the end result is spontaneous human combustion. In essence, a, a human Hiroshima effect, a thermonuclear explosion, if you will, in the body. Is spontaneous human combustion the result of a pyrotron colliding with a particle inside the human body? Did George Mott die from a freak collision of physics? There simply is no plausible way uh, by any chemical mechanism known that the body could just suddenly burst into flames and proceed to be destroyed. Joe Nickel is an investigator of the paranormal and a firm believer that spontaneous human combustion is a myth with a rational explanation. I looked at 30 historical cases from the 18th century throughout the 20th century. And in every case, I could find a plausible source for the ignition. For example, uh, the famous case in America of Mary Reeser in 1951 in St. Petersburg, Florida. She burned up in a, in a very unusual way, sort of one of the classic cases. But when she was last seen, and this is left out of some of the, the stories, she was wearing flammable night clothes, sitting in a big stuffed chair, smoking a cigarette, having taken two second-all sleeping tablets and planned to take two more sleeping tablets before going to bed because she was having trouble sleeping. Now, it's kind of a no-brainer to suggest that she caught on fire by dozing off and dropping her cigarette. Yes, yes, there are other mysteries. Why did her body burn so thoroughly and why were nearby objects? We take those one at a time. And in these cases, you can't just have a sort of simple-minded, one-size-fits-all explanation and say, oh yeah, that's just this. No, you have to actually look at the, the facts in a particular case and look at the physics, because there are no two quite alike. The most logical explanation for the George Mott fire was a canister of matches sitting on, of all places, his oxygen enricher unit. He had either been somewhere to light a stove uh, or something, and a spark could have gotten onto his clothes. But how could a spark or a cigarette burn a human body to the extent seen in SHC cases? In the forensic literature is something known as the wick effect. And that is, if you think of a wick in a candle, the wick is not doing much burning. The wick is simply a conduit. Now, if you think of the human body as sort of a candle inside out, the body has a lot of fat. It's very flammable. Sounds horrific. How can someone become a human candle? 
The clothing acts as a kind of wick in which once the body begins to burn, that body fat can be absorbed by clothing, mattress, and that begins this cyclical process in which the body burns, releasing more body fat to destroy still more of the body to release more. It's the wick effect that's helping this burn in a very efficient way. There's never a big fire when the body burns in this way. It's not a huge inferno. The results afterwards may look like that's what happened. But what actually happened is just that the body burned very slowly and very efficiently where the body fat was, in the torso, the upper thighs. You'll often find limbs or body parts that are not burned for pretty obvious reasons. They're not, they don't have as much body fat. Even a lean person has a significant amount of body fat. So this, while this isn't an explanation for all burning deaths, it's a relevant factor in some of the unusual cases because it can explain why over a period of several hours a fire is progressing and attacking and burning a body which is actually supplying the fuel for its own destruction. But if your clothes catch fire, you simply put them out, right? In some cases, the person may have had a seizure or a heart attack. In other cases, they may have been lying asleep and smoldering material near them first started burning, creating a lot of smoke. They may have died of smoke inhalation and never woken up. Nickel believes that his theory can explain the almost complete lack of fire damage around the body. Since there's never a big fire here, nearby objects are not gonna be burned. Just as you can sit just inches away from a campfire and toast a marshmallow and not be burned, the same is true with this wick effect. But does this explain the other objects that were melted throughout George's house? The heat, of course, is gathering and rising. Objects above a certain line will be melted because the heat is accumulated there. And in the Mott case, there was soot all over. There's usually a sooty deposit if there's a lot of organic material being burned. For Nickel, the answer is clear. If science knows anything about spontaneous human combustion, it is that it doesn't exist. It's difficult to prove a negative, but we don't have to. There just is no evidence. It is To say it's unlikely does not do justice to how very, very, very far-fetched this idea is. The George Mott case was a mystery. I would consider it basically a mystery solved. Does Nichols' theory prove that SHC does not exist? Can these horrific deaths be explained by the Wick effect? We've tried to conduct those experiments ourselves. We know others in the forensics field who have done so. They can't replicate these fire scenes under controlled scientific conditions. It doesn't work for us, and it did not work for the local investigators in Essex County. This is an example of individuals making up facts creating stories, generating hypotheses without foundation to explain away something that they don't otherwise want to confront. Spontaneous human combustion is amazing, bizarre, horrific. Given all that, it still happens. So is spontaneous human combustion real? It's a debate that will continue to rage. One thing we do know for certain, though, it's definitely weird. Or what? A British woman reports an ability that defies science. Can she harness electrical power? The possibilities of things going wrong are just mind-blowingly frightening. You know, when it comes to medicine, there's very little modern science can't explain. Oh, my God! What is that disgusting thing in there? Oh. Sometimes we come across things that are not only inexplicable, they send a shiver down your spine. Or in the case of our next story, a million volts through your hand. Whoa! Weird? Oh! Or what? Growing up in London, England, Debbie Wolf thought she was a normal child. I think when you're a small child, you don't realize you're different from anyone else. 
But my mum got it pretty quickly, I think. Shortly after Debbie turned four, her mother noticed there was something rather unusual about her daughter. My mum noticed, like, hot spots of problems. It was just the era of um, everyone had Walkmans and I drained the batteries and light bulbs seemed to be quite vulnerable. My mum wouldn't touch me if she was switching the light switch on because a jolt of electricity would go through her. Incredibly, it seems this tiny girl had somehow become supercharged with electricity. But what could cause this weird phenomenon? For Debbie and her family, it's just the start of a bizarre and literally shocking ordeal. Every time I walked past the telly, the channels would start changing. The volume would go up or down, and it would switch off. I was always excluded from the lounge when the football was on because my dad didn't want me changing the channels. Incredibly, when Debbie interacts with anything electrical, havoc ensues. She fries appliances, drains batteries, and explodes light bulbs. And as she gets older, the condition gets worse. There's one particular occasion that I remember. Um, I can't have been more than about six. Uh, we went to this shop, one of my mum's favourite shops, and as we went past each streetlight, it went off and on and off and on as we passed them. Remarkably, Debbie's electrical power grows with every step. By the time they arrive at the shop, things are getting out of control. They had these metal rails where the clothes were displayed, and for some reason that seemed to spark me. So much so that I could touch it and you'd see sparks and you'd hear the crack of the spark. So my mum tried to herd me away from that. But her mum doesn't act fast enough. Debbie's touch electrifies the entire store, blowing the fuses and plunging it into complete darkness. Terrified of her young child's weird power, Debbie's mum rushes her from the shop. My mum made rules about what I was allowed to do and not allowed to do because um, it was disruptive. What happened to Debbie Wolf? Could she be cured by medicine? Or did she need an electrician? Sadly, her condition hasn't gone away. Over three decades later, she is still suffering. I affected everything. I lost a job in a nightclub because every time I walked past the DJ box, the music would go off. My house is just like a graveyard of electrical goods. And I've usually got a TV or something sitting in my drive waiting to be taken to the dump. I get through an extraordinary amount of kettles and toasters and TVs. So I tend to buy second-hand TVs. Um, and it is expensive and inconvenient, and I'm not always welcome in people's houses. I don't know from day to day what's going to work and what isn't, which is quite annoying when the fridge is defrosting um, in the morning. So uh, basically, my house is just, you know, on a short lifespan. The thing I hate most to do, but I have to do it anyway, is flying. I just hate flying. The fear of being able to stop a plane in midair and having it drop out of the sky. No, 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 because the possibilities of things going wrong are just mind-blowingly frightening. Is Debbie somehow generating lethal amounts of electricity? If so, how and why? Incredibly, she isn't the only one suffering from this bizarre affliction. Thousands of others have it too, and it's even been given a name. Street light interference syndrome. Those who have it are called sliders. What are sliders and where do they get their supercharged powers? Are they a threat to themselves or even us? Bill Beatty is an electrical engineer. He thinks he can explain sliders. I um, first heard about this um, in the 80s and I started wondering, are they some kind of um, electric generator? Could sliders like Debbie actually be generating their own electricity? How could she do it? 
Speedy thinks her power could be an extension of something we've all experienced. So if you scuff on the rug and touch a doorknob and you hear that little click, that's static electricity. The effect is caused by your body being charged. Rubbing your feet steals negatively charged electrons from the carpet. With each step, you steal more electrons and develop more of a negative charge, something easily detected with a voltmeter. If I scuff on the rug, watch what happens. I'm scuffing my shoe, oh, and they're all, they're all turning on and off. This, this is me moving my shoe up and down on the, on the carpet. There's some more over there. So a science fair project for kids, a little transistor voltage detector. So if you were an electric human, I, um, you wouldn't have to scuff on the carpet. So if I could um, stand perfectly still and wait for long enough for my charge to go away, oh, it's gone again. So it already leaked away here. Um, I would be turning the light on and off if my body charged up by itself. So I'm not an electric human, oh well. But could this build up enough charge to affect a street light? Beattie believes sliders could generate large amounts of static electricity in another way. Well, there's one thing that um, humans do which might explain this, and that's um, breathing. Every day, humans take over 25,000 breaths. Remarkably, Beattie thinks it's possible we can steal a few electrons from the air each time we breathe in and eventually supercharge our bodies. If you can charge your body up by breathing, you have this field, invisible field of voltage around your body that can affect electronic devices, even from a few feet away. But if everyone breathes air, why would only a few people, like Debbie, turn into human lightning bugs? There's a chance of that it could be a virus that hasn't been discovered yet. There are a few viruses that they're not like the flu or colds. And instead, when you catch it, there's almost um, no change, and then your, your body easily fights it off. Um, if it's um, communicable, then you'd think that there'd be lots of electric humans, or you'd get it for a while, and then it would be gone again. But this sounds more like it might be something that's um, uh, like a symbiotic thing, that maybe you're born with it, and you can't give it to other people. Could some yet-to-be-discovered virus alter the lungs of sliders just enough to strip electrons from the air and turn them into supercharged humans? Or is Beattie's theory a few connections short of a circuit? Oh, I was attracted to it because it's weird. But the vast, unstudied collection of weird things, some of those are real. And those are Nobel Prize discoveries. So let me get this right. Sliders have an innate ability to wreak havoc on electrical goods, especially uh, street lights, right? And one guy thinks the reason they can do this is there's a virus going around that can supercharge your body as you breathe. Nothing. Can't we come up with a better explanation? I mean, when it comes to electrical faults, isn't it just a matter of some dummy doing something Stupid. So do sliders really have the power to generate electricity? The phenomena, to me, is not a real phenomena at all. Around the world, hundreds of people known as sliders claim to have the ability to interfere with electricity. Do they have a science-baffling superpower? Lee Colville has studied sliders for five years. He thinks he's found another way to explain the phenomenon. It's hardly improbable that anyone can generate enough electricity to, to affect a street lamp. You know, we're talking about millions of volts here, as, as with a lightning bolt, and obviously a, a very high current flow. I mean, basically, if anyone could generate that amount of electricity, I mean, they, they would kill them. You know, the current flow them, it itself would kill them and probably fry them, and they'd be blowing cars up and all sorts all over the place. You know, you don't see that. So. So therefore, it's very unlikely. The most plausible explanation to me is basically pure coincidence. But how could pure chance explain the incredible effect sliders have over electrical devices like street lamps? Most people are not aware of how the street light works or what happens when there's street light malfunctions. Here we have a common example of a street lamp, which is a high pressure sodium lamp. 
Many street lights use powerful sodium light bulbs. When they get old, they don't just burn out or even flicker like fluorescent bulbs. Instead, they begin a process called cycling. It will turn off. When it cools down, it will basically come on again. Obviously, it will get too hot, then it will cool down again, come back on again, cycling on and off periodically. If someone walked under a cycling street lamp at just the right moment, they could think they turned it off. But what about Debbie Wolf? She made a whole street go haywire. A row of lamps that's probably installed at the same time, so the chances are that if one is faulty, you're going to find another one that's faulty on, on the same row. Do faulty street lights explain this mystery? What about all the other electrical gadgets that sliders like Deborah destroy? Static electricity, it's, it's, it's mundane as that. If you've got someone with very dry skin, you could build up quite a large voltage. And by touching any electrical appliance, it could discharge and cause damage to um, sensitive components. Are sliders just mistaking static electricity and coincidence for superpowers? There's no reason to be frightened of spending time around a lead slider because the phenomena, is, to me, is not a real phenomena at all. So, is this the end of the mystery? Maybe not. Suan Jaising is a mechanical engineer who was intrigued by Debbie's story. A person being able to produce energy or harness energy is much like the X-Men, so it kind of provoked my interest. He's come up with a remarkable new theory to explain what is happening. I'm a bit skeptical that the body alone can generate enough energy to knock off electrical uh, street lights, but Debbie's body could absorb energy uh, from around us and release it in, from, in the form of an electrical pulse. Instead of creating electrical energy, could Debbie actually be sucking it up from the world around her? Electricity plays uh, quite an important role in our human body. Theoretically, one could uh, possess the ability to store electricity through their bodies, just like a capacitor. Capacitors are common in all electronics. They are used to gradually soak up excess electricity and then discharge it in a flash. Could Debbie be a human capacitor? Her body may possess uh, molecules that are able to harness this power. To prove his theory, J. Singh has conducted tests designed to try and stimulate Debbie into releasing an electrical charge. Using an oscilloscope, an instrument which measures voltage, he compares her output to someone with a normal charge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, show you some images, see whether we are able to uh, simulate some electricity. Okay? Debbie seems to become most electric when she's excited or stressed. Jason uses images he hopes will recreate those feelings. Although not conclusive, some of Jason's experiments have produced surprising results. With Debbie, we noticed that there was a voltage that was being measured from her body uh, that was different to what could be measured from ours. So the slider phenomenon does exist. But this phenomenon isn't something Debbie can turn on and off at will. It's very hard to bring myself to a place where I'm going to be electric, I suppose. I mean, I'd be a much richer person if I could do circus tricks, and I can't. It just happens. Are Debbie and thousands like her really able to store electricity and release it in a flash? Could a rare virus have turned them into human generators? Or could it all be just a series of shocking coincidences? Whatever the answer, it's most definitely weird. But what? So there we have it. Three bizarre medical mysteries. An Arkansas woman baffles medical professionals by surviving a horrific skydiving accident. 
In upstate New York, a man vaporized in a fire leaves investigators asking, can humans spontaneously combust? And Aruba people report being able to interfere with electricity. Do they have an inexplicable superpower? You decide.